be sure and pick up one of our monthly bulletins that's next to the door. There's an article on the back that goes along with the picture that's on the front, and we hope that you'll pick up one of those. It has our calendar on the inside. We want to welcome all our visitors. We're glad that you're with us. Hope that you will stay for our Bible class. Stay after Bible class. We're going to have a meal together. You are more than welcome to stay for that. Tonight we have 6 o'clock service, and we hope that you will come back for our evening service. Wednesday night we have changed the times. On the bulletin, the time hasn't changed. It still says 7.30, but it is 7 o'clock on Wednesday nights now. The sign hasn't changed yet, but it is 7 o'clock from now on. So um, uh, make that mental change uh, in your mind, and we hope that you will join us midweek so that we can uh, study the Bible further. Finding contentment. Being content. The world is pursuing this type of peace. The world is pursuing this type of attitude. But they're looking for it in all the wrong places. Contentment. Paul tells us, as he writes to Timothy, a young gospel preacher, how that we can find contentment. How that we can be a person that is content. The word for content in the Greek is defined as a perfect condition of life in which no aid or support is needed. A sufficiency of the necessities of life. That is the very definition of the word in the original language. So we look into God's Word, and we see that Paul is going to tell us how we can be content. First of all, as we look at the context here, we see that contentment involves the pursuit of godliness. The pursuit of godliness. You see, we're not going to accidentally get content. It's not going to accidentally happen. It's not going to be found in the psychology of the world. It's not going to be found in the pleasures of the world. It's not going to be found in all the things that the world goes after. Contentment involves the pursuit of godliness. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. Paul says, Now godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. Notice Paul here is talking about what is great gain, what advantages us in this life. Godliness with contentment. Look at verse 11. As he talks to Timothy, a Christian, he says, But you, O man of God, flee these things, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and gentleness. The pursuit of godliness is what produces contentment. Godliness godliness with contentment is great gain in this life. The word godliness in the original Greek means reverence, a respect, a piety towards God. Have you ever noticed that people who are unbelievers are very angry? They're not content. The people that I know that are atheists, they're very bitter. They're very bitter towards God. That's why they claim not to believe in God and they have an anger about them. And they're not satisfied. And they want to fight against God. And so the very opposite of godliness is ungodliness. And atheism and skepticism brings about a lot of bitterness and confusion. But godliness is a reverence and a respect and a piety towards our Creator. And we see all throughout the Scriptures how this attitude of pursuing godliness, submitting to Him doing His will, having a respect for Him, brings about contentment and peace in our life. In the same book, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 9, or excuse me, 7 through 9. 
First Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 through 9, Paul says, But reject profane and old wives' fables, and exercise yourself towards godliness. For bodily exercise profits a little. But godliness is profitable in all things, having the promise of the life that now is and that is to come. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. Notice what Paul says. You reject these old wives' fables, these myths, these stories. That's what you're not to focus on. But you exercise yourself towards godliness, a reverence, a respect, and a piety towards God. Because bodily exercise has a little bit of benefit. But godliness not only benefits us here in this life, but in the life to come. Therefore, there is a great deal of benefit in us seeking after godliness in which we will find contentment. All throughout the Proverbs we find this. Proverbs chapter 9, verses 10 and 11. Proverbs 9, 10 and 11. Concerning respecting God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. For by me your days will be multiplied and your years of life will be added to you. So we see here the beginning of true wisdom is a fear of God. Not only believing He exists, but fearing Him, respecting Him, having a reverence towards Him, understanding the authority that He has in our life. Therefore, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. In Psalm 14 and verse 1, it says, The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. So we must not only believe in God, but we also have to have a fear of Him. That is the beginning point of all true education. A belief in God and a respect for Him and His will. Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 27. Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 27. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life to turn one away from the snares of death. To fear God is a fountain of life. That's going to produce life in us. As a general rule, if we live in the fear of the Lord, we're not going to be reckless with our life. And as a result... We're going to live longer than the person who doesn't fear God and is very reckless with their life, whether it be with drugs, alcohol, whether it be uh, violating the laws of the land. They're going to be very reckless with their life. And as a result of that, they are going to have their life cut short as a result of disrespecting God's will. But the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life, not only physically, but also spiritually. Therefore, it has great benefits, not only in this life, but in the life to come. Proverbs chapter 19 and verse 23. Proverbs chapter 19 and verse 23. Notice this. The fear of the Lord leads to life, and he who has it will abide in satisfaction. He will not be visited with evil. Contentment. Satisfaction. If you have the fear of the Lord, if you're pursuing godliness, which is a reverence, a respect, and a piety towards God, then you will abide in satisfaction. It will bring about true contentment. Now back to our text. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Contentment also involves proper priorities. Contentment involves proper priorities. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Verse 11, But you, O man of God, you, Christian, flee these things. You pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and gentleness. Contentment involves proper priorities. 
You see, Paul is telling Timothy that you're not going to find satisfaction in the pursuit of the riches of this world. And there's no one that would know that better than Solomon. And Solomon said in Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and verse 10, He who loves silver will not be satisfied with silver, nor he who loves abundance with increase, for this also is vanity. You're never going to be satisfied. If you love riches, now notice, it's not money that's the root of all evil, it's the love of money. If you love silver and you love gold, you're never going to be satisfied. Is that not what we see around us? Why is it almost on a weekly to monthly basis, we hear about a celebrity being arrested? A celebrity who has millions of dollars in the bank being arrested because they're involved in drugs, being arrested because of a DWI, being arrested because they're publicly intoxicated. They're not finding satisfaction in all the riches and the things of this world, and therefore they go to drugs to try to find satisfaction and contentment. And they're not satisfied with these things, and when people love the pursuit of riches, they're not going to be satisfied with what they have. It's very interesting that we are told that those who win the lottery within a few years are broke. Because all the riches that they get, they spend it all. And they have nothing to show for it but the things that they purchased and they spend themselves into the poorhouse because they're never satisfied. It's never enough. And so contentment involves proper priorities. We know that we're not here just to accumulate stuff. We are here to glorify God. Isaiah 43 and verse 7, we were created for God's glory. We're not created here, created to be here to see how much money we can make. We are created to glorify God, and that involves being godly and having a piety towards Him, respecting Him. And so Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21, Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourself treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Don't put your focus on laying up treasures here upon the earth. Nothing wrong with having a retirement. Nothing wrong with having riches. In fact, we are all very rich compared to the the population of this world. Nothing wrong with those blessings. In fact, God blessed Solomon with riches. But we have to have a proper attitude towards them. We have to understand they're not going to make us happy. What will make us happy is doing God's will, and we're laying up treasure in heaven as we serve Him, and as a result of doing that, we glorify Him, and we don't put our focus on the treasures here upon the earth. And that's why he says in the latter part in Matthew chapter 6, verse 31 through 34, Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about its own things, Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So we're not to worry about the necessities of life because God promised that if we believe Him and obey Him, He will provide us with the necessities. We'll be taken care of. So we lay up our treasure in heaven by doing His will. And if we have a lot here upon the earth, we're to glorify God with the lot we have. If we have a little here upon the earth, We glorify God with the little that we have. However, our treasure is in heaven. You know, Paul understood that. He lived this attitude. In the book of Philippians chapter 4, while in prison for preaching the gospel, in deplorable conditions, he says, I speak in regard to, not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am in to be content. 
to be content whatever condition I find myself in. I know how to be abased. I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So if we have our priorities in the right place. We're seeking first the kingdom. Christ is number one in our life. And we're serving Him. We can find contentment because we trust His promises that He will take care of us. And we don't have to go after all the pursuits the world has to go after. Because we have such books as the book of Ecclesiastes. Where Solomon says, I've done that. And it won't make you happy. Therefore we know by the other writings of the Bible what will make us happy. What will bring about true contentment. Now, back to our text once again. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 12. Contentment involves fighting. Contentment involves fighting. Look at verse 12. After talking about being gentle, Paul tells Timothy, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. So fighting brings contentment. Now we know that this is not referring to physical fighting because the church is spiritual in nature. The weapons of our warfare are not physical, Paul tells us. We understand that he is talking here about the spiritual battle that we fight. Even though we are to be patient, verse 11, even though we are to have love, verse 11, even though we are to be gentle, we're also to fight. And sometimes we forget that. You can be gentle and loving and patient and fight at the same time. Again, he's not talking about being contentious. Being contentious is the attitude in which you're looking for a fight where there's nothing to fight about. You're looking for something. That's not what we're talking about at all. Paul here is referring to the fight that we have, that spiritual warfare that we are in, because the devil is our enemy, and that we must fight against him. Our commander-in-chief is Christ. We are in his army, Ephesians chapter 6 Verses 10 through 18 tells us we're to put on the whole armor of God that we might fight against the wiles of the devil. He is trying to destroy our faith. And we have to be ready for that. We have to be ready for what he is going to throw at us. And so Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3 and 4, You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. You see, when we obeyed the gospel, we were enlisted as soldiers. We were baptized into Christ. We entered into the body of Christ, which is the kingdom, which is also an army. It's a 100% volunteer army. No drafting in this kingdom. It's 100% volunteer. And therefore, as a result, we have chosen to serve the Lord. And not only we serve the Lord, but we fight for the Lord. Jude verse 3 says, We're to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. That word contend means to fight for. And in the, the whole book of Jude's talking about false teachers and how we have to fight against false teaching. We not only have to fight against false teaching and be warned about that, we have to fight against the temptations that we face each and every day. Those personal temptations that are a part of our life, we must fight them and resist them. And in fighting them, we will find contentment. We will find that which satisfies. 2 Timothy 4, verses 6-8, through Paul understood this. And towards the end of his life, he made it very clear, I am ready, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. 2 Timothy 4, verses 6 through 8. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. 
finally, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but to all those who have loved His appearing. If we do what Paul did, if we fight to the end, if we're faithful into death, Revelation 2 and verse 10, then that crown of life awaits us just as it awaited Paul as he reached the end of his life. This would be the very last scripture that he would write, 2 Timothy chapter 4. Soon after that, he would be killed for the faith. And he says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And having fought that good fight, do you see at the end of his life, his contentment? See his contentment? Because he fought. Sometimes it gets weary for us to fight, does it not? We have to fight denominationalism. We have to fight atheism. We have to fight liberalism. We have to fight sometimes with our own brethren. Sometimes we have to fight with our own family members who are brethren. But we can't give up. The devil wants us to give up. The devil wants us to grow weary in the fight. And just throw in the towel. But true com- com- contentment involves fighting for the Lord. Back to our text, 1 Timothy chapter 6. Contentment also involves submitting to the Lordship of Jesus. Verses 13 through 16. Verses 13 through 16 of 1 Timothy chapter 6. I urge you in the sight of God who gives life to all and before Christ Jesus who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate, that you keep the commandment without spot, blameless until the Lord Jesus Christ appearing, which He will manifest in His own time, who is the blessed and only potentate or sovereign, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power, Amen. So we see here that Paul is urging Timothy that as he made that great confession himself that Jesus Christ is the Son of God at his own conversion, verse 12, that he remained faithful to the Lord as Jesus made the good confession before Pontius Pilate that he was the Son of God, indeed. That, they, that Timothy is to keep the commandment <coughs> without spot. That is, without any kind of contamination. Blameless until the Lord Jesus Christ appearing, whenever Jesus returns. And He will manifest Himself in His own due time. Whenever Jesus returns, it will be His own due time. He is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Jesus is ruling now as King of kings and Lord of lords. We know that he has a kingdom because the kingdom is the church. Matthew 16, verse 18 and 19, the word kingdom and church are used interchangeably. That church kingdom was established in Acts chapter 2. And Colossians chapter 1 and verse 13, when people obey the gospel, they're translated out of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear Son. So the church is the kingdom, but Christ is ruling over all the world. In his prayer, John 17 and verse 2, Jesus said, You have given me authority over all flesh. The church is submitting to his authority. The rest of the world isn't. When people convert out of the world into the church through obedience to the gospel, they come under his rulership. They willingly submit. Yet he is king of kings and lord of lords whether people realize it or not. And true contempt contentment involves submitting to Him in our life. In Luke 6 and verse 46, Jesus said, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things which I say? And He goes on to talk about the the foolish and the wise builder. The wise builder building his life upon the words of Jesus on the rock, doing what He says. The foolish builder not doing what Christ said, even though He heard what Jesus said. 
So we have to have the attitude of submission that goes back to the concept of godliness. A respect and a piety towards God. Colossians 2 and verse 6, As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. You have received Christ Jesus the Lord in becoming a Christian. Live your life in Him. That's much more than just saying Jesus is Lord. That's much more than just having the bumper sticker. That's much more than just having the t-shirt. That's much more than just having the cross on the necklace. It's living the life each and every day. Because Christ is Lord. And in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 11, Paul says that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You see, the world has no direction. Jesus one time saw a multitude of people. He had compassion on them. and He, he, he had compassion because He said they were like sheep without a shepherd. They had no direction. They had no guidance. They had no leadership. And that's what the world is like. And therefore there's no contentment in the world because in doing their own thing, they, they can't find contentment. The only one who knows how to give us contentment is our Creator. He knows what's best for us. He knows what will make us happy. He knows what will bring true contentment in our life. And therefore, when we submit to His will, we will find contentment. Finally, contentment involves giving. Verses 17 through 19. Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty or prideful nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who richly gives us all things to enjoy. Let them do good, that they may be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. As he instructs the rich here, he does not tell the rich to get rid of all their riches. He instructs them, to be very busy about not trusting their riches and helping those who are in need. There is a true blessing that comes in helping those who are in need. Acts chapter 20 and verse 35, Paul tells us this as he talks to the Ephesian elders. I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. We need to have the attitude of giving. When we see an opportunity to give, we need to be able to do it and be able to help as individual Christians and as a church. Galatians 6 and verse 10. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. It is a good sign of a healthy church. When it hears about a tragedy in another country, that it says, what can we do to help? What can we do to help the people of Haiti? And so this church has helped financially the, the people over there, some of the brethren, some have helped individually. And that brings about a blessing. That brings about contentment. So we see here in our context the formula for true contentment. And we can find contentment in this life. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5, we'll end with this verse. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For He Himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be content. Perhaps there is someone here that needs to respond to the Lord's invitation. You have discontentment in your life because you haven't obeyed the Lord. You have sin in your life. We urge you to repent. We urge you to believe that Christ is the Son of God. We urge you to make that confession and we urge you to be baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will know based upon the promises that you're forgiven and you'll have contentment. Perhaps you're not content in your life because you realize you've got sin in your life and you've refused to repent of it. We urge you to repent and confess your sin. As always, the choice is yours while we stand and